Since 1953, WIVK has been committed to the University of Tennessee as a learning institution and to its athletics department. In 1988, we donated our AM 850 radio station to the University of Tennessee Communications Department to help students further their broadcasting career. We've been involved in many major promotions with the athletics department, such as Smokey's How each football Saturday and the world's largest spring football game, plus many, many more. In 1989, we became the official voice of the Vol Network with host communications. On football Saturdays, eight hours of continuous football programming, the most extensive in the Southeast. During basketball season, we take you from the Tennessee tip-off show to the Wade Houston show. And this year, we're proud to join the University of Tennessee as they celebrate 100 years of University of Tennessee football. And we look forward to being involved with the University of Tennessee for many, many more years to come. So join us each football Saturday and during basketball at AM 990 and FM 107.7. General Nealon was gone, and there was pressure, but Bowden Wyatt came out swinging in 1962. Come hell or high water, he wasn't changing. Hitching up the single wing one more time, he faced a challenging schedule, and it proved to be too much. Tennessee finished four and six, losing three games by a combined total of four points. Yet immediately after the season, Wyatt was still UT football coach and athletic director. He coached spring practice, and then at the SEC meetings, UT President Andy Holt decided to make a change. Bowden had a problem, and finally he became so ill he had to give up coaching. And when he did, they named Jim McDonald interim coach and named me as athletic director. McDonald got a one-year contract, and as it turned out, it lasted less than that. His 63 vaults improved a notch to five and five, but little else within the program had changed. We switched jerseys and suppose we were going to uh, uh, get rid of the single wing, go to the tee, and I guess the big thing of that year was, like you said, the different colored jerseys, the Halloween jerseys, and uh, we ran a tee formation for the first time and ran, I think, one play that whole year from the tee. Oh, I, I like Jim. He's, he's very knowledgeable of the game and got along great with the kids. and. Uh, and uh, I'm probably just sorry it was a one-year thing for him. I felt at the end of the first year we needed to go into the T formation, all the other schools were gone, and I thought this, this was the route we had to go. And it was my recommendation that we bring in Doug Dickey, who was assistant coach at that time under my first backfield coach that I have it at Baylor University, Frank Broyles from Georgia Tech. The Dickey-Woodruff connection had begun over a decade earlier at the University of Florida, where Dickey quarterbacked the Woodruff-coached Gators to their first bowl game ever. Dickey was not a well-known commodity outside of the coaching profession. So even after Woodruff's recommendation, he would have to sell himself to board members. For Dickey, that was no problem. Two questions he answered that impressed me. One was, what does it take to go from single wing to a, a T formation? And he said, a quarterback. And uh, I said, how and with whom would you expect to do your principal recruiting? And he said, in the state where we're located. And if you can't get the people from that, you're going to be in trouble. So Dickey impressed me uh, from the word go. The 1964 University of Tennessee Volunteers could be called the New Look Vols because for the first time, Tennessee will not be using their famous single wing offense this year. The Vols will go to the T formation, directed by their youthful new head coach, Doug Dickey, shown talking with UT Athletics Director Bob Woodruff, who was Dickey's coach at Florida where the new Vol mentor was a quarterback. Dickey has been a chief lieutenant to Frank Broyles at Arkansas before becoming head man of the Volunteers. So Dickey was hired and a new era began for Tennessee. 
The returning players weren't immediately enthused with the hiring, preferring McDonald continue on. But the 31-year-old Dickey got their attention too. Doug Dickey told us how to win football games. And I was impressed with uh, his presentation. He was a very direct person. Uh, he's still very direct. And uh, he's business, but uh, I enjoyed playing for Coach Dickey. Enthusiastically, Dickey began the task of putting UT back on top of the SEC. It began with an off-season workout plan, good recruiting, and a lot of help. I think at first, uh, yes, I was nervous at 31, being a head football coach of a major school with a seemingly instability at that point in its program. But the encouraging thing to me about the University of Tennessee was the great tradition that I thought we had an opportunity to build on. Uh, the Nalen years were not that far back. Uh, Bowden Wyatt had really done a great job coaching wherever he'd been, and that uh, things had gotten uh, a little out of hand. And so uh, some changes needed to be made by the university, and they did. Um, and I think a lot of the credit, secondly, in the second part of unifying everybody has to go to Jim McDonald. Uh, when I got here, Jim McDonald said, uh, come on, we'll get in the car, I'm going to take you recruiting. And uh, they did a very good job of making Jim McDonald an assistant athletic director, and he did a great job, I think, of being a team player and helping me. And I, I, I can always give him a lot of credit for that. And he made it easy. Uh, it wasn't easy for Jim, but he made it easy for me, and I think the role he took fit Jim very well. Dickey's first year didn't find a brilliant record for Tennessee. Four wins, five losses, and a tie to be exact. But Vol Fever was back or even better than ever before. Dickey put a giant T on the side of UT helmets. He restored the Vol garb from the orange and black Halloween jerseys to the traditional orange. He saw the pride of the Southland Band and its talented director, Dr. J. Julian, as a potential source of motivation for Vol fans. The development of the giant T through which Tennessee storms onto the field was a stroke of genius that leaves chills down the spine of UT fans. It helps to set the mood after the rousing pregame performance from the band. When Coach Dickey came, he was very interested in the band and he thought we should have a little more hype. And he's actually the one who designed the tea and opened the tea. And in fact, I remember the, the week that we practiced on it. He had the team come and even practice going through the tea. But that has really become a tradition. I think if the band didn't form the T, why well, there'd be a lot of complaints about it. Some even worried about the T when we opened it from the end zone instead of the 50 yard line, but evidently that didn't create too much of a commotion. But the Tennessee people have a great tradition in football, and fortunately, they uh, seem to have a tradition with the band too. The role of the cheerleaders continued to be important as did that of Tennessee's mascot since 1953, Smokey, the Blue Tick Coon Hound. Individually, these elements may not do it, but together, Dickey and the many people that assisted him in this endeavor had created an atmosphere where Vol fans could get charged up before the game. Basketball coach Ray Mears, a marketing genius in his own right, coined the phrase, this is Big Orange Country and UT backers from all over began to make the trek to Knoxville every time a game was at hand. Dickey's team certainly did their part. His Outland Trophy winner Steve DeLong sparked a swarming, aggressive defense. The new T formation was a source of curiosity to ball fans, even if it wasn't smoothly run at first. For the record, the first T formation quarterback was Hal Wantlin, and then Art Galiffa took over to complete their first season. The Beatles may have captivated Americans in 1964, but in Tennessee, it was Dickey doing the captivating. 1965 was a strange year. Tennessee was 2-0-1, entering their annual battle with Alabama. The game was to be played at Birmingham, only adding to the theory that UT was doomed against the Tide for the fifth straight year. The game itself was a war, and with a score tied late, Alabama was driving for what appeared to be the winning points when one of the weirdest plays in UT history occurred. A Bama sophomore quarterback named Ken Stabler took a fourth down snap inside the ball 10 with only seconds showing on the clock and threw the ball out of bounds. Yes, the snake got the clock stop, but he was all out of downs and Tennessee had escaped with a seven all tie.
I thought he'd either lost his mind or, or they they were so overconfident that they thought they could whip our defense for the three or four yards they had to go to get a touchdown instead of worrying about uh, kicking a field goal and winning it. And, you know, I didn't know what he was doing, but I didn't think he was going to get three or four yards against our defense right then. And then all of a sudden I looked up and it's fourth down. What is he doing? He's throwing it out of bounds. Uh, he just blew it. We go down Birmingham, come out of there with a tie with Alabama, and we actually felt like they tied us. And the next morning, three of our coaches get killed. On the Monday that immediately followed the game, assistant coaches Bob Jones, Bill Majors, and Charlie Rash were carpooling to work when their car was broadsided by a train. Instantly, Jones and Majors were killed, while Rash was able to hang on until week's end before dying. Everyone was stunned. Two days earlier, they had been to the top of the mountain, and now they were seeing the very bottom. I'd gone to work, and we were all kind of coming in at the same time, and by the time I got to the office, there was a call saying we'd had a, uh, a very bad accident, and that uh, one person had been killed, and or two had been killed, and one of them was in very critical condition, and I um, um, went to uh, uh, Bobby Jones's house, and uh, I uh, felt that was a place I should go. They'd been here the shortest period of time, knew the fewest number of people, sent some of the other coaches to the other houses, and I remember going, and uh, uh, that's a tough situation, to have to go in and, and tell somebody what's happened, uh, very young children. I think there were seven young boys uh, in those three families. So uh, uh, that particular time, uh, I think, uh, was... Uh, uh, without a doubt, the toughest time that uh, anybody can live through. It's in the toughest of times that the best come to the front. And Vol fans saw they had those types among both coaches and players. Outfitted with black crosses on their helmets, the Vols took Houston that Saturday and began a mission the rest of the way, bowing only to Ole Miss in their next five contests. The last regular season game was an odd matchup. This clash had been set up by Woodruff and Bruin Athletic Director J.D. Morgan almost immediately after Woodruff became A.D. at Tennessee. And I suggest we play on neutral sites like Memphis. And so we finally scheduled this game in Memphis. Well, they had an old uh, Duke football player from Tennessee. I said, well, Tommy, uh, J.D. and I got this game scheduled for Tennessee and UCLA. He was a coach, and I said, it's going to be on a neutral site. He says, neutral site? Says, That's like playing Notre Dame in Rome. <laughs> At 6-1-2, and two, the Big Orange was headed to the Astro Blue Bonnet Bowl, while the Bruins had a Rose Bowl date waiting. It was dubbed the Rose Bonnet Bowl for that reason. I don't know how we came up with it, but we were getting ready to go on the air, and I said, you know, this one team, they're going to the the Rose Bowl and we're going to the Blue Bonnet Bowl and uh, together somehow we came out with Rose Bonnet which was most appropriate <laughs> and uh, it turned out to be better than any bowl game. It was a high scoring back and forth affair that was obviously going to be won by the team that had the ball last. Fortunately for Tennessee it had the final possession. It also had Dewey Warren at quarterback. Fourth down and goal for Tennessee. The quarterback is Dewey Warren. One was set on the wing to the left. Warren, the quarterback. And he spins. He rolls to the left. He keeps the ball. He's going to run. He makes a touchdown. It was a pass play, and he went back and took about two steps, and there was nobody open, so he just started. He pulled it down to run. Uh, it, was, it was a definite pass, supposedly, all the way. And he ran. It looked like for 15 minutes trying to get to the goal line before he finally got there. He wasn't the most fleet of foot. And uh, I'd say that he probably killed the grass. He ran a long time in the same spot, it seemed like to me. It ended 37-34 with UT on top, but not before a game-ending interception by Bob Petrella. Petrella happened to be on the wrong side of the field when he stepped out of bounds. Here, it got ugly. Instead of getting on the ground and stopping the clock and playing it safe, he starts running up the sideline, running out a little time, and one of their players stepped off the bench and hit him in the forehead with a, with a forearm, 
and of course knocked him cold and uh, bloodied his uh, head and, and blacked his eyes and uh, we had a bad scene out of that. From the media standpoint, the best was yet to come. Memphis native Tommy Prothro, who was in charge of the UCLA program, stated after the contest that he was ashamed to be a Southerner. When you really think about it, maybe Prothro did what every fan wanted him to do. He kept the game going long after the final whistle. And to the football purist, this was a contest that no one wanted to end. The game was a back and forth by two very good teams offensively. They had Mel Farr and uh, Gary B. Ban and some great athletes. And uh, this was a very fine offensive football team that we had at that point in time. We could move the ball, throwing it, running it, and had a very sound offensive line of scrimmage. And so um, football was at its best on that given day uh, in the excitement of the fans. The contest was a classic. It what turned out to be a side note compared to the Rose Bonnet Bowl. The Volunteers won the Blue Bonnet Bowl to finish with an 8-1-2 season. 66 brought another eight-win campaign and another bowl victory, this time over Syracuse. But a loss is the most remembered game of this season. In the driving rain at Knoxville, Tennessee led Alabama 10-3, having outplayed the Tide the entire contest. But as they did so often under Bear Bryant, the Red Elephants scored 11 points to take the lead by one with little time remaining. Tennessee, however, hadn't forgotten the script that said, it's over. Charlie Fulton, who had started the year as UT's quarterback, hit tight end Austin Denny on a flea flicker pass. And the balls were deep in Bama territory. In the huddle, it was, I don't, I've forgotten what the name of the play was, but uh, it was all Dewey said was, uh, try to get open because he's going to fire it to you and I I know watching the films as soon as he threw the ball some guy leveled him he never saw it was complete or not I believe he even had stitches taken in his chin after that ball game but uh, it got us down to where we had a shot to win a ball game Gary Wright was dispatched into the fray to try a 20 yard field goal from the difficult right hash mark the kick sailed barely wide and Bama had escaped Wright's teammates, disappointed as they were, immediately rallied to his aid. You know, it was just one of those unfortunate uh, mistakes as an athlete, or not a mistake, but one of the things you're trying to do your very best and it doesn't turn out the way you want it to, you'd like to take it back and have a chance to redo it a hundred times over, but, you know, it doesn't happen in life. I think it boils down to a love-hate relationship. We love Gary Wright a lot more than we hated Alabama. Back-to-back -back eight win years put Tennessee right on schedule to be a contender for their first SEC crown in 11 years. But if they were championship caliber, the Big Orange didn't show it in the season opener, falling 20-16 to to revenge-minded UCLA. The Bruins, led by eventual Heisman Trophy winner Gary Beban, helped to make it as close as it was by fumbling to set up both UT touchdowns. It was time to regroup, and apparently they did it well. After beating Auburn and Georgia Tech, Tennessee got another crack at Alabama, which sported a 25-game win streak. That was to end on this October day. UT won 24-13, but not before defensive back Albert Dorsey had a day that would make him an All-American and a Sports Illustrated cover boy. At least it looked like Dorsey. Everybody thinks I was on the cover because that was my big ball game but it was actually Mike Jones on the cover. Actually, it was the worst game I played all year until the last quarter with the opportunity of three interceptions. But up until that point, I played horrible the whole ball game. And the grading, that was the worst graded film I had the whole season. And if it hadn't been for the pluses that you get for the interceptions, I would have been in the minus column in my grade. The most important game, I think, during the whole time I was here was the 1967 Alabama game. Uh, it was the first real opportunity we had to win a championship from that point on, and uh, I think it uh, said that we're here to stay. The Vols swept through the final six games, which included a convincing win over Ole Miss, Tennessee's first since 1958, winning the league and garnering an Orange Bowl bid to face Oklahoma. This was another of the great games from the Dickey era. The Big Orange fell behind 19 to nothing before Jimmy Glover's third period interception return for a touchdown got the Volunteers on the board. Tennessee had rallied within two. When it looked as if the victory was within their grasp, the Sooners, trying to hang on to the football, 
chose to go for it on fourth and one at their own 43. They ran All-American Steve Owens at the ball D, and he was stopped short. UT took over and drove it down to the 27, where Carl Crimser was called to win it with a field goal. The talented kicker saw his kick spin wide right. So uh, uh, we don't win it. Uh, it was one of those games where I felt like uh, I'm not sure the best team won. But uh, we had our chance to win it. We were a little about five yards short of where we need to be to kick that field goal. 1968 arrived with some new faces and a new look. UT has seen no less than eight men broadcast their football games. Most of all fans can just name three, but for you trivia buffs, we'll run them down. Pat Roddy Jr. became the first, followed by Joe Epstein, Mel Levitt, and Knoxville radio legend Lowell Blanchard. The fifth man to do the games is probably better known for his plaid sport coats, New York Mets baseball, the Cotton Bowl, and Notre Dame football. He's Columbia, Tennessee's own Lindsey Nelson. While he did the games in the late 40s, Nelson also became the first man to put together a semblance of what we know today as the Vol Radio Network. So I called the general and got him on the phone. I said, General, I got an idea. He said, what's that? I said, I'd like to bid on the rights for the broadcasting Tennessee football games. He said, well, I'd as soon entertain a bid from you as from the stations. I said, have one small trouble. He said, what's that? I said, I want to bid $10,000. He said, nothing wrong with that. I think if you bid that, you'll get it. I said, no, the trouble is I haven't got $10,000. And he said, well, you must have an idea. And if a man will show me how to make some money, I'll certainly share it with him. So come over and let's talk about it. Shortly after undertaking this task, Nelson was off to fame in New York. And Edwin Huster Sr. began in earnest to put the network together. Huster crisscrossed the state adding stations one by one to make the Vol Network the nation's largest college football network. After Alan Stout followed Nelson in the early 50s, Tennessee went to get a full-time broadcaster to fit the bill with the expanding radio following that the Vols were gaining. So the athletic department hired George Mooney away from the University of Arkansas. One day I was called right after quarterback club meeting in Memphis and uh, General Nealon was there and they were discussing, and he said, we'd like to have you do Tennessee football. And so I was very flattered and honored, and I said, General, <laughs> I think uh, that can be arranged. Mooney remained in this role for the next decade and a half before John Ward got his chance in 1968. Ward, a Knoxville High graduate, received his law degree in 1953 from Tennessee. Ward pursued broadcasting the hard way, from the ground up. For all of his hard work, the call that came in 1968 was very satisfying to Ward. I remember that Coach Woodruff called me into his office and he said, now, we don't want to do anything that will interfere with your doing the television football, which would be the selling of the sponsors for Coach Dickey's TV show, which in essence was saying, don't take any time away from selling the sponsors if, that, if to do the play-by-play. -play. I said, it won't interfere at all. So I was uh, excited, uh, very enthused, and uh, have been ever since. He was paired immediately with Bill Anderson, the former Vault and Green Bay Packer end. It's now been over 20 years, and Ward is known affectionately as the voice of the balls. And Anderson is trusted by many to explain the complicated football of today. Now, in college radio coverage, everybody I say everybody, probably everybody, has a former player along with a play-by-play -play man. That's totally accepted now. But in 1968, except for Tennessee, that was totally new. Another new face in 1968 was that of Lester McLean. Having played his high school ball at Nashville's Antioch, McLean was recruited along with Albert Davis of Alcoa to be the first two black football players at UT. Only McLean survived and eventually prospered, catching 70 passes in three years, 10 of which went for scores. To this day, McLean takes great pride in being a pioneer at Tennessee. You know, you can think about all the pros and cons, but uh, yeah, you'd do it again. Um, it's been a great help to me. Everything that you do, you're still pioneer some. The new look, artificial turf on Shields Watkins Field. 
It was in this season that Woodruff and Dickey took the 3M company up on an introductory offer, lifted the grass in Neyland Stadium, and became the first team in college football to play their home games on AstroTurf. We had problems on getting enough practice field. If you, you, <coughs> you can't really scrimmage and practice on a playing field, uh, it would natural grass. Uh, and, and I thought about building a practice field out of artificial turf, and some people did. But I didn't have the amount of money it'd take to do it, and so we went ahead and put it in the stadium. With the change in surfaces, the season opening opponent Georgia was upset. It took some work, but the dogs showed for what turned out to be a great game. A game that saw UT score on a Bubba White's pass to Gary Chris with no time on the clock. And then tally a two-point conversion to earn a 17 all-time. That was an unbelievable game to score eight points after the game was over time-wise against a good football team. Uh, it was just, and there was so much about that game in addition to the game itself, in that Joel Eves, who was the athletic director of Georgia, had really objected strenuously to playing the game on artificial, on an artificial surface. That game has never really gotten as much credit as one of the all-time great Tennessee games, in my opinion, as it should. The 68 team was a bit of a surprise, as the Vols earned a Cotton Bowl bid with an 8-1-1 one one record. Bubba White fortunately was here and we had Richmond Flowers and uh, we moved Richmond Flowers from wide receiver to running back. He played running back in, in high school and so now we've got a uh, new dimension. We've got a lot of speed that we haven't had playing the halfback for us. And um, uh, at that point uh, we, we come together pretty well. Uh, we get away with things uh, because of speed that we don't have to make happen for ourselves. We get some get a three yard hold and make a 12 yard run in case and out of it. So, uh, Bubba threw the ball very well, uh, and I think we managed to have, to me, probably the biggest surprise that I'd had all along in coaching was that team. I really didn't know where that team could play that well. Coming off of another good year, Tennessee was the odds-on favorite to win the SEC title in 1969. Steve Kiner and Jack Reynolds led the defense from their linebacker spots. Muscle man Chip Kell anchored a strong offensive line. And Bobby Scott and Kurt Watson provided offensive punch in the backfield. Methodically, the 69 Vols went to work and destroyed Alabama, Auburn, and Georgia. By the time week number seven of the campaign was done, Tennessee stood at 7-0 and number three in the nation. Next up was a trip to Jackson to face four and three Ole Miss, and something came back to haunt the Volunteers. The, the uh, build-up to the Ole Miss game really started in preseason when we had the Skyriders tour and they asked uh, uh, Steve Kiner who was going to win the SEC and he named a couple of teams and Ole Miss wasn't one. And one of the writers baiting him a little bit, Steve would say, he was very outspoken, said, uh, what about Ole Miss? They've got a lot of horses. And uh, Steve's reply was, you don't know the difference in a horse and a mule. So uh, they uh, got a mule out on campus all week and carried it around and, and uh, they were just very, very up for the game. And it was probably the most hostile environment I've ever been in. Uh, if we had not showed up that day, they'd have chosen up and fought among themselves. They were gonna have a, a battle down there that day. And when the game started, things just went their way. They, they played a great game and uh, we played awful. The 38 to nothing loss crushed major bowl hopes. It left Tennessee to stagger home with narrow wins over Kentucky and Vanderbilt. The Vols' eighth SEC title was of little consolation as UT was headed to the Gator Bowl to face upstart SEC rival Florida. And if you thought fireworks were to come from the game, you were wrong. You see, word leaked out that Florida was in the process of forcing out their coach, who happened to be UT grad Ray Graves. The rumored replacement was Florida alumnus Doug Dickey, and Dickey had known that this was coming for some time. They had made a decision very early in their season that they were going to do a change, and Coach Graves was going to retire, and they had told me so, and uh, I said, well, when the season's over, we'll talk about it. Now it was time to start talking, and everyone was. But surprisingly, 
few of the players were very unsettled by what had turned into a circus. As I recall, the news came out during that week, and we had a meeting, and um, Coach Dickey, in, in rather adroit uh, fashion, uh, kind of delayed the issue. I don't remember exactly what he said, but I remember playing the ball game, not really believing he was leaving. The game went on, and Tennessee put on a lackluster performance in a 14-13 upset loss. A couple of days after the loss, Dickey took the job at Florida, and a match thought to be made in heaven ended. Dickey won 46 games in his six years at Tennessee, took a pair of SEC titles, and guided the Vols to four bowl games. To this point, Dickey had to be regarded as the second best coach in UT history. All things considered, ball fans had faith in Dickey and genuinely liked him. Now he was gone. But today, it's 20 years later, and Tennessee's athletic director is named Doug Dickey. A little bit older and grayer, but otherwise unchanged, Dickey isn't afraid to speak openly and honestly about his decision. I had not made the decision to go to Florida until after the game was over, and we backed off for a couple days and really thought it over then. It was a circumstance to where uh, in 1970 or 69, December 1969, my family all lived in Florida. I had young children uh, who I didn't know where they were going to college, and um, both my wife's family and mine lived in Florida. It was home. Uh, they'd never won a championship. I just won two championships at Tennessee. I felt good about coaching, and uh, uh, I thought the opportunity for the University of Florida and for myself were the right opportunities uh, from a personal and professional mix. So Tennessee had to decide upon a coach, and Bob Woodruff would make the call. Woodruff had shocked everyone involved when he picked Dickey in 64, and he did it again. Woodruff tapped 28-year-old Alabama graduate Bill Battle for the post. One day, Coach Woodruff came to me and said, uh, you know, there are three coaches on our staff that I feel like are head coach material, and you're one of them, and uh, if things work out the way it looks like they're going to, uh, we may want to talk to you. And I guess I, I th always thought I would be a head coach at some time, sooner or later. It was a little bit sooner than I thought. Uh, but I thought I was, you know, at that point that I was ready to, to, for whatever happened. But I still wasn't too uh, concerned about it because I didn't think it would come about. Uh, so Coach Woodruff called and said, uh, come on back down, I'm going to talk to you. And, so it, it got into a, a very interesting couple of weeks or week uh, with, uh, with me and uh, basically Jimmy Dunn and Doug Knotts in the picture. And then uh, it evolved more and more toward me for whatever reason, and it, uh, it ended up that way. And I observed him over four or five years, and there's no finer person that's ever worked for me, and uh, I thought he deserved a chance to be head coach. And I think he did pretty well and with the record he had. One other man who had recognition within the Vol football family was turned away. Iowa State head coach Johnny Majors. Well, I guess, you know, we all have certain egos. And I thought I was probably the logical choice, but it just shows things don't always turn out the way you think, the way you expect, the way you hope. But now I'm darn glad it didn't turn out that way. Selfishly speaking, I had a lot more excitement in life, but without it happening. Ball fans were excited about the possibility of a UT grad coaching the team and were not fired up at Battle's hiring. Even members of the board were questioning Woodruff. Dr. Holt called me one morning and said, what are we going to do about the head coach? And uh, I said, well, Woodruff wants Battle, and I think that uh, uh, Majors might be uh, the man we should take at this time. I believe Bill Battle, uh, and I described him in the newspaper article, Ben Bird, as one of the nicest fellows I ever knew, a perfect gentleman all the way around. I couldn't say anything too nice about him, except I just simply thought he did not have enough experience to hold down that job. And Andy said, well, your vote is my vote. And I said, well, that makes it still harder because I do not believe that you can keep a man in as athletic director and fail to support him or go along with his uh, recommendations. The, the consequence of that position, if taken, would be you'd get rid of the athletic director, and that's the last thing I want to do. 
So consequently, I think we have to go with Balaam. Now that's the real story. But now the Vol in coach was the Vol head coach, and he had an incredible returning team. Dickey knew what he was leaving, and Battle knew what he was getting. After bumping off SMU to open the season, the Vols were upset by Auburn. Tennessee wouldn't lose again the rest of the way, but back-to-back -back weeks during the 10-game win streak are certainly worth a look. First, Battle met his old team, and then faced his old boss. Any team that was ever coached by Coach Bryant was good, and even when they were going six and five, you, you, whoever you were, particularly if you were me and had played for him, that there were there was unique feelings stirred up. And then, of course, any team prepared by Doug Dickey was good, and I had first-hand knowledge of both of those. But respect wasn't going to help either Alabama or Florida in 1970. First, Tennessee crushed the tie 24 to nothing, and then ruined Dickey's return to Knoxville with the 38 to 7 thumping of the Gators. The Big Orange players readily admit that they wanted this one badly. Without a doubt, uh, you know, uh, uh, the respect and everything that I had for him was still there and everything, but uh, uh, when, when we put on the orange jersey that day, uh, I mean, it, it was blood and guts. We were going out, to, out for blood. The year concluded with the Volunteers crushing the Air Force 34-13 in the Sugar Bowl. Scott concluded his UT career in style, ringing up 24 first quarter points as the Vols became only the third UT football squad to win 11 games in a season. The 1970 team was an odd mix. Their individuality meshed with the going thought of the turbulent times, but they knew what a talented team that they were on. We give so much attention today to the individual stars. I mean, in, in 1990, we all look at, look at how good Andy Kelly is or how good Chucky Webb is, and we forget, frankly, how important and how unique a team is. That was a team of really unique individuals who somehow or other put aside their differences and like any other group of 90 people, there were lots of differences and melded into a unit. I mean, we knew we were not gonna get beat. We should not have gotten beat. That team should have been a national championship team. In 1971, Battle could see that reality was about to set in. He returned a quality team, especially on defense, where Jackie Walker, Ray Nettles, and Bobby Majors would make a solid unit. Offense was a different story. The biggest worry was finding a quarterback to replace the multi-talented Scott. Dennis Chadwick was the leading returnee with Phil Pierce, Chip Howard, and a little-known senior from Nashville named Jim Maxwell in reserve. By mid-year, the job was Maxwell's and he guided the Vols to a 9-2 regular season finish, which included a 31-11 triumph over previously unbeaten Penn State to close out the year. It was a day when UT saluted Tennessee's first football family, the Majors, and Bobby Majors followed the script to perfection, making two long punt and kickoff returns each, and throwing in an interception for good measure. Majors had a great day. He was the offensive player of the game. Uh and played safety, didn't play an offensive play other than kick returns. Uh, and uh, Bobby Majors had a great day that day. He uh, returned the opening kickoff, got us in good field position. We got a couple first downs, kicked a field goal. We kicked off, they were coming down the field, just uh, we didn't look like we were gonna be able to stop them. And uh, uh, they ran a, a play that is very vivid in my mind. Uh, he ran the counter option to the to their right, uh, our left, and Huffnagel uh, countered and faked the ball to the fullback, came out on the corner, ready to pitch it to Mitchell. Jackie Walker, the strong side linebacker, scraped off outside the end and came up and hit Huffnagel as he pitched the ball. And Conrad Graham, who was screaming up in, in run support, uh, the ball popped up in the air as Jackie hit Huffnagel and Conrad caught it. Took off straight down the line of scrimmage, guys, two or three guys running parallel, turned up the far side and ran 78 yards for Testa. Conrad made the turn in the north end zone. Nettles butted him right under the chin and knocked him clean under the fence. As you know, the fence back in those days was right outside the end zone line. Uh, the whole team piled on because this was a great play and, and the Fans were going crazy, and it was uh, 
You know, it was something that really turned our team on and turned the whole game around. The Vols accepted a bid to face Arkansas in the Liberty Bowl, and this was a wild one. The Razorbacks had an All-American in quarterback Joe Ferguson and led 13 to seven late in the contest. The Volunteers had one last shot. Kurt Watson's run gave UT a 14-13 triumph that would be hotly disputed by Arkansas partisans, but nonetheless gave Tennessee a 10-win campaign. Arkansas had played a very good game, very close uh, uh, defensive game. Uh, had a lot of uh, tough calls for Arkansas. They had tried a field goal, and uh, for some reason, there was offensive holding on a field goal. And uh, you don't see that very often, and they were quite upset about that, how they could be charged with offensive holding. And uh, <laughs> on a field goal attempt, of course, that dropped them back a few yards and they didn't make the field goal. So that was one controversial call. Then the next controversial call was a fumble in which I think Carl Witherspoon got the ball. And it was, and I think you can watch the film, it's obvious that the Arkansas guy fell right on the ball. But all at once, if you watch the film, you'll see the entire defense, and we were very good at doing this, as soon as the guy fell on the ball, and you look at the sideline, even everybody on the side, everybody in one single motion almost takes it and says, our ball, Tennessee. And the official comes running up, and he believes the UT team, and we're all punching, it's our ball. Well, down in the pile, the, the ball was taken away, and we came up with the ball, and the ball was given to Tennessee. And a season filled with great defensive plays, Johnson took the honor as having the most spectacular one. Yes, Graham had a super play against Penn State, and Jackie Walker returned three interceptions for scores, giving him an NCAA career record of five. But Johnson provided the shocker. He just came down the line on a straight down the line option. Pretty simple play. Uh, and he just kept coming closer and closer. And I wanted to stay in position. I just punched him with my left arm, extended my left arm. When I did that, he pitched at the same time. I mean, there the ball was, and uh, I ran some 87 yards. And uh, the big joke then was half the team caught up with me and turned around and was, uh, you know, it was quite comical really on the film as you watch, because I, I ran out of steam about halfway. 1972 was a carbon copy of 71 record-wise, with Tennessee going 10-2 and, and winning the Astro Bluebonnet Bowl over LSU. But the year saw change, big change. Bill Battle made a radical move by SEC standards, tapping sophomore Conridge Holloway as his signal caller. Holloway came from Huntsville, a highly touted quarterback, but most people bet against him playing that position in college. Holloway is black and it caused problems being the first of his race to start at that position in the Southeastern Conference. But he turned down an $85,000 offer to play shortstop for the Montreal Expos in order to fulfill a personal goal. We might as well set the story straight here. My, my mother made that decision. And uh, that was, you know, that was something that uh, she felt was best. Uh, I, uh, I wanted to go play baseball. Without a doubt, but uh, I think it's worked out well. I, I, I'm happy that I uh, got the opportunity to come in and play quarterback and and be put in a, get the exposure that a quote unquote black quarterback is supposed to get. I never felt that way. You know, I never I never went out on the field thinking that I was Martin Luther King or anything like that. I mean, I went out to do my job and play football. You get out there against 11 other guys and start thinking politically, you're going to get killed. I mean, you're going to get hurt badly. You better concentrate on what you've got to do. And then after the fact, all that other stuff will take care of itself. The two memorable games from that year featured both bitter and sweet moments for Holloway and company. First, there was a 28-21 win over Penn State in the first game played under the lights at Neyland Stadium. I think Joe Paterno made a statement, and I, I might be misquoting him, but it was something to the effect that he didn't, he never wanted to play in Tennessee again unless it was at night because it was too hot. And their players did die out in that game in the fourth quarter, so the fact that Tennessee went through all the painstaking uh, movements to 
get lights and play them again, and they came back down and we beat them. It uh, wasn't the weather. It was a football team. Been a disappointing 17-10 loss to Alabama, which was a personal dismay, especially to Holloway, who fumbled twice in the final quarter. A very bad ending to an otherwise well-played football game. Uh, after that fumble, uh, I think the next two plays they scored, and our defense had shut them down all day. And uh, it, was, it was something I'll always remember, more so than the good times, because uh, it was a game that we should have won, and we just didn't. The 1972 season marked the end of an era of sorts as the UT trainer decided to call it quits after being in the job since 1938. O'Brien worked for seven Tennessee coaches, and he was the boss when it came to determining a player's health, even with General Neyland. General liked to kid him all the time, and he could never tell when the general was, was really serious or whether he was kidding him. But General had a great time of always pulling pranks on him or something, so. But they had a great relationship, and the guy was a tremendous trainer, you know probably is, you know, a Hall of Fame trainer, so that's the only one we've ever had here at Tennessee, but he's a tremendous one. Tennessee fans were disappointed with two straight years of losing to both Alabama and Auburn, but had no idea that the Vol football program wouldn't see 10 wins in a year again until 15 seasons later. 1973 should have shown them just how strange things might get. Duke led the Big Orange in the opener 17 to seven in the fourth period when Holloway pulled out a miracle. The one thing I remember about that run is the fact that I ran into somebody I didn't even see. I, I kept back into uh, a group of people just trying to protect the ball. And I think I got hit so hard I got knocked out of it. And that's what happened. I, I remember ducking under somebody's arm and, and then I got hit. And the next thing I knew I was out there by myself and I just ran. After recovering a fumble late in the game, Holloway converted a fourth and four, setting up Haskell's standback to be the hero. As the Volunteers won a 21 to 17 thriller, Army fell next. Then UT ended a three-year jinx against Auburn. His linebacker Hank Walters was named National Player of the Week for an incredible performance in the Vols' 21 to nothing victory. Eddie Brown was the star of the Kansas game, keeping Tennessee in it long enough that the offense could rally for a 28-27 win. Then Holloway led the Volunteers to a 2014 win over stubborn Georgia Tech. Then it was Alabama. Both teams at 5-0 and at the top 10, both with high-powered offenses. Alabama scored on an 80-yard pass play on the game's very first play. But by the beginning of the fourth period, the game was even at 21 apiece. Then Robin Carey ran 64 yards for a score with the Neil Claybo punt. And the Tide went on to a 42-21 win. And UT had not beaten Alabama in its last three tries. Three weeks later, Battle began to field some heat. With his 6-1 team leading Georgia 31-28 late in the fourth period, the coach called a fake punt deep in Tennessee territory. Mike Overton was the freshman center snapper on the, the punt team. And I remember him turning to look back to make sure that he had called a fake punt. And uh, Georgia had 11 men on the line of scrimmage ready to rush the ball. And uh, Mike snapped it back to Steve Chancy, and, and he was almost caught dead in his tracks. He didn't get back to the line of scrimmage. And uh, the momentum for the whole game changed right then. And Georgia ran it down inside our uh, five yard line. And we held him, it was a, a third down play. And snap came back, and the quarterback missed the handoff dropped the ball while our whole defense swarmed to the running back and uh, he picked the ball up and ran around in and scored the winning touchdown as time expired. I'm a conservative person and I was a conservative coach and the last thing that I ever wanted to do was call a fake punt. Uh, but I felt like that's what I had to do to win the game. He stood right up and faced it and didn't try to put the blame on anybody but himself and he said he made the call and I think and one thing that happened in the dressing room after that Coach Battle got up in, the, in front of our team and he said, boy, you guys got a stupid coach. You know, I made a mistake and blah, blah, blah. And I, I, I think it was, I know I said something, but I think another guy, Ronnie Wheeler, got up and said something. That, and, it, and from that point on, it made our team that much closer because basically what we both said was, hey, coach, 
when we lose games, we don't get up and, and do stuff like that. I mean, you don't have to get up and explain to us what happened. We're all in this thing together, and we win and lose together. And this is just a game we lost, and we all lost it. The 35-31 homecoming loss stung. And with the Vols finished 8-4 after a 5-0 start, the Wolves began to howl. They were really on the young coach when UT was 2-3-1 and one at mid-year in 1974. But Battle rallied the team with five wins and a tie in the final six games to salvage the year. Included in that was a 7-3 victory over Maryland in the Liberty Bowl, where quarterback Randy Wallace came off the bench in relief of Holloway and hit Larry Sievers for a score with less than three minutes to go. Condridge got hurt, and uh, we were behind 3-0 very short time to go in the game. That had been a, a strange year anyway. And uh, Randy, we had practiced me coming across the field and him throwing it high. He knew exactly how high I could jump. So everybody thought it was an errant pass. When in reality, that's what we'd always worked on. And uh, worked out good and we won seven to three. This win also marked the end of the Conridge Holloway era at Tennessee. In his three years as Vol quarterback, Holloway had given UT fans thousands of thrills. But maybe that typified his career more than his return from injury, the 74 season opening tie with UCLA. There's Congress Holloway coming back into the stadium. He's been to the hospital, he's been x-rayed, and there is obviously nothing broken. There are not many stars, but Condridge Holloway was a star. And so he was the player that people expected to come back, even if the leg were broken. He was a star, and he came back and not really deliberately, but just naturally, he played it to the hill. He, everything, when he came back on the field, to the field, around the field, and came over to the west sideline, everything he did was done to build the moment. I thought they were reacting to a play, because I, I just came out and I didn't know that it was me. I thought they were Something good had happened, so I was trying to get over to get to Coach Battle to get in, and uh, <laughs> that's, that was funny. That Coach Battle says, "Peanut, you can't go in," and I just ran in. <laughs> I don't think he's going to send me in the gate. I just went. Conridge Holloway always went and went till they couldn't go anymore, but now he was passing star status on to Larry Sievers. Clutch catches were becoming a way of life for amazing Sievers. The Clinton native made an immaculate reception for a winning two-point conversion in the 74 thriller with Clemson. Then two super grabs against Auburn in 1975 helped the Vols to a big win. The 6'4 Seavers made the tough catches look routine and boggled the mind of everyone who saw him play. He was an unusual receiver in that he's big, tall and rangy, you know, and uh, had great hands. He didn't have uh, that much speed but he had an act of getting open, and if they got the ball anywhere close to him, he was able to come down with it. And so you'd have to rate him right up with one of the top all-time great receivers, I think. Seavers combined with Stanley Morgan to begin a tradition of great wideouts at UT that would lead to Tennessee's being known as wide receiver U. There had been great receivers before to wear the big orange, like Buddy Cruz and Bill Anderson in the 50s, and the acrobatic Johnny Mills in the mid-60s. But Seavers and Morgan would be followed by speed merchants like Anthony Hancock, Willie Gall, Clyde Duncan and Lenny Taylor, Tim McGee, Joey Klinkscales, Eric Swanson, and Anthony Miller. And more recently, the school's leading pass receiver, Thomas Woods. In addition to Terrence Cleveland, Alvin Harper, and Anthony Morgan. Pro scouts have beat a path to Knoxville to check out ball wide receivers over the last 15 years. And no other school in the nation can claim to have produced this kind of talent at this position over that period. But back in 1975, Stanley Morgan had sacrificed and made the move to tailback for the good of the team. Morgan set a school record with 201 yards on 11 carries in the season finale at Hawaii, a game that served as a bowl for the seven and five volunteers. A loss to Vandy had sealed the bowl fate of Tennessee is there would be no holiday trip for the first time since 1964. But 75 is remembered for a loss, a stunning loss. North Texas State came to Knoxville and upended UT 21 to 14. 
players and coaches didn't know how to react to this defeat. Uh, they came into Knoxville and our guys were not ready to play. Uh, we had done a poor job of preparing them. We tried to get them ready to play, but we weren't successful in doing that. Uh, we thought we could, and, and everybody thought we could, uh, we could come back and win the game, whatever happened. I think we had 550 yards of offense, but we couldn't get it in the end zone. So the bicentennial year of 1976 started with pressure for battle. Tennessee's record had slipped in each of his last three years. North Texas State and Vanderbilt had beaten UT the previous year. And the Volunteers hadn't knocked off Alabama since 1970. The season opener could have foretold the future. The Big Orange fell to Duke 21-18. Each team scored three touchdowns, but the study in futility showed the Vols as not having made an extra point. We had a good group of senior players. Uh, we thought we had a chance to, to win the conference. Uh, I don't, it, it was, it was just strange. It wasn't the, the, the town wasn't pulling together. The team wasn't really exactly together. Uh, nothing was pulling together. Everybody was looking over their shoulder. Guys make bad plays and getting booed. And uh, it, it just wasn't, it wasn't a very fun year. By mid-year, Battle's troops had rallied to three and two and were catching a down Alabama team at home. After a six-all tie at the half, Bama rallied to win 20 to 13. The emotion showed in the coach's face. This win would have been huge for him, but again, it simply wasn't to be. The pressure built until UT faced Kentucky in the next to last game of the year. A Peach Bowl bid was on the line, but more than that, it was pride. Tennessee hadn't lost to the Wildcats in 12 years. People were used to having the traditional beer barrel in Knoxville since it became a symbol of victory in this game way back in 1925. But on this bleak November day, UK simply had the better team, beating Tennessee 7 0. The locker room after the game was like a morgue, and the news that came the next day was not unexpected. I decided that at, at, after that game that it was. Uh... Uh, that, that they, the, the Tennessee people needed to be rallied and that, uh, that I couldn't rally them. And so I decided to resign after that game, and, and that's what I did. The final week of practice was loose, and the Vols did their thing at Vanderbilt the next week, winning 13-10 to 10 and sending Bill Battle out on their shoulders with a win. The battle era ended, but the good feeling about the classy young coach never does. And I remember the exact word that I closed the Bill Battle television show with. And when I said, uh, Bill Battle, head football coach, who made us all proud to be from Tennessee. Battle cared for his players, so much that in 1974, he gave his biggest star a chance to quit so that he would be healthy to play professional ball. I can remember so vividly, Coach Battle taking me in his office, and uh, I, when he said this to me, I actually thought he was joking. He looked me in the eye, he said, Peanut, he said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, you've done a lot for the University of Tennessee. You, uh, we're not doing real well right now, and you're getting beat up pretty good. He says, I think you have a chance at a professional career, and I just want to tell you that if you think that your professional career is going to be hindered by you continuing this season. I'm offering you the opportunity not to play football anymore and just get ready for your professional career. And I said, are you kidding me? He says, well, the option is yours. And I said, well, I got to be at practice. I'm not quitting. But it, it wasn't like quit the team. It's just that for my personal health, he wanted me to be able to play professional ball. He didn't want anything to hinder that. And I said, you got to be kidding me. And he was seriously offering the, the opportunity, but I didn't even consider that. That, quite simply, was Bill Battle. Pecking Tennessee's next coach was going to be easy. It would not involve choice, but a mere coronation. Ladies and gentlemen, after an extensive nationwide search, I don't know. <laughs> pleased to have a small part in uh, welcoming Coach Majors here. Johnny Majors had taken Iowa State to a pair of bowl games in five years, an amazing feat, and then moved on to Pittsburgh, where he inherited a team that had been victorious the previous year only once. With incredible recruiting, 
The Panthers were obviously the best team in the nation in 1976 and stood at 10 and 0 when Bill Battle resigned to Tennessee. UT officials came calling, but Majors wanted to wait before talking. But the talks began and Majors agreed to return to his alma mater, but not without great trepidation. I have to say that that is definitely the most difficult decision I've had to make in my life. I agonized over it. It does not, and yeah, it, it was exciting to think about taking the challenge to come back to your alma mater. But I've been out of Tennessee for 17 years. I always came back to visit in the summer, spend time primarily with my family. We were at home. We'd stayed four years, and we liked it, and it was an exciting place to live, and I heard it wasn't easy. It hurt, and I'll tell you the truth. Uh, it hurt more than just a year when I came, when, I, when I'd go back to Pittsburgh to see, you know, because we knew the people there. Even though I was excited about the Tennessee job, trying to get it going, but taking a Tennessee job, uh, I didn't realize how far they were behind. Expectations were high, but the Tennessee football program wasn't high on talent, and it showed. In 1977, the Vols posted a four and seven mark, and in 78, only managed a five, five and one record. People got the message that majors had been sending. The Big Orange had a lot of work to do. The highlight of Major's first two years back at Tennessee was probably a great play by a running back from Sheffield, Alabama. At a game against Florida in 1977, Kelsey Finch put his name forever in the UT record book, rambling 99 yards for a touchdown. It was third down play, we were trying to set it up so we could punt the ball. And uh, I just, we had a simple off tackle play call. Uh, you know, and uh, as I hit through the hole, there was just nobody there. And I can remember cutting and going out to the sideline. I remember very distinctly Roland James was standing on the sideline, uh, hollering, they're going to catch you. I can, I, can, I can still hear him hollering that now. And uh, I can remember at the time hearing him saying that and remember, uh, remember just running for my life. But it was uh, it, uh, something that's it stayed with me. It was an exciting moment for me. Bristol native Greg Jones closed out his UT career in style in the season finale of the 77 campaign, personally ransacking the Vanderbilt offense in Tennessee's 42-7 thumping of the Commodores. Jones wasn't the first ball linebacker to dominate a game, nor would he be the last. As a matter of fact, UT has been known for its great linebackers for the last 30 years. There have been great tandems like Frank Emanuel and the late Tom Fisher in the mid-60s. The Bruisers from the late 60s, Steve Kiner and Jack Hacksaw Reynolds, Ray Nettles and Jackie Walker in the early 70s, Alvin Tolles and Carl Zander in the early 80s, and Kelly Ziegler and Keith DeLong in the late 80s. Individual stars like Mike Lucci, Paul Newmoff, Jamie Rotella, the late Andy Spiva, the school's all-time leading tackler, Dale Jones, and one of the ball's defensive captains in 1979, Craig Pukey. By 1979, the Volunteers showed promise, but not consistency. A Gary Moore kickoff return for a score began a 35-17 win over Auburn, handing the Vols a 3-0 start. The Vols led Alabama 17-0 in the second quarter of their October 20th game at Birmingham, but then fell to the eventual national champions 27-17. Still, it brought hope. Two weeks later, a Knoxville newspaper declared, what are a Rutgers? But the Vols found out losing this homecoming clash to the Scarlet Knights 13 to seven. The very next week, the world turned for the Volunteers as the long awaited home matchup with Notre Dame produced a 40 to 18 UT triumph. The team went crazy, the fans went crazy, and Hubert Simpson surely went crazy fulfilling the promise set out for him when he left McMinn County three years early as he scored four touchdowns while rushing for 117 yards. It was a day to remember. I was real proud Notre Dame recruited me out of high school. They didn't really recruit me too much out of high school. And I kind of thought I might like to go up there and at least visit, but Dan Devine sent me a letter saying I wasn't major college potential. It was especially fun to beat them in Knoxville in front of all the home fans. I, people in Tennessee don't seem to like Notre Dame or real great deal. The crowd got to Notre Dame a little bit. They were not sharp. They had mental lapses. Simpson had a great performance and everybody was uh, psyched for the game. Uh, that was a very memorable uh, moment for Tennessee. It had to be one of the one of the great. That's another great football game. With a 7-4 finish, 
Tennessee ended up in the Astro Blue Bonnet Bowl, facing Big Ten stalwart Purdue. As had apparently become the tradition of either getting way ahead or behind in bowl games, the Vols trail 21 to nothing at the half. Before the Silva Street, quarterback Jimmy Streeter got untracked and nearly pulled out a win. The Big Orange Bow 27-22, but enthusiasm was at an all-time high during the Majors era. Stadium expansion had re-begun in 1962 after a 14-year layoff. And in four-year intervals, General Neyland's plan was coming to pass. Before the 1980 season, the North End was made into a bowl, raising seating capacity to over 90,000 by that time. People were truly ready when the Georgia opener rolled around on September the 6th. And the ball started with a bang, jumping out to a 15 to nothing lead. Then Herschel Walker happened and the dogs went on to simply take one away from the volunteers, 16 to 15. The next week may have been worse. After getting behind 10 to nothing, Tennessee rallied behind backup quarterback Steve Alatore to tie Southern Cal at 17, driving for what appeared to be the winning score. Alatore had a pass intercepted. On the game's final play, USC got a 47-yard field goal to win it 20 to 17. The balls were 0-2 and heartbroken. We were probably the best 0-2 team in the country. We played a two. I mean, I think Georgia ended up going undefeated that year. Also, and won a national championship in Southern Cal didn't do too bad. Um, I guess the Georgia game probably was the most heartbreaking because of the game which we had in our graphs that we should have continued to play better. But the team rallied for three straight wins, including a stunning 42 to nothing triumph at Auburn. And hope dawned that the Alabama Jinx would end at eight. Instead, Bama broke Tennessee's back 27 to nothing in the pouring rain holding the ball offense to almost no yardage while running wild against UT's defense. The Big Orange would never be the same as they finished a disappointing five and six. We happened to catch four schools that were as good as they've ever been, all right in the prime of USC, Georgia, Alabama, and Pitt all that year. And uh, we played that first part of the year, we played them real tough and Alabama and Pitt just blew us away and they were that good. Just when it looked like things couldn't get any worse, they did in 1981. Georgia handed Tennessee a 44 to nothing loss to open the year. And then USC administered a 43 to seven knockout punch. The Vols got up and freshman quarterback Alan Cockrell's exciting running style got the fans going in a blowout win over Colorado State. Alan Cockrell was a good athlete, you know, and a big strong uh, kid. And uh, did well, uh, played well. He got better and got to where he could throw halfway decent. But I don't think yeah, he really wasn't uh, intent or meant to be a quarterback, I don't think. But uh, out of desperation and whatnot for somebody that could play the position that uh, Tennessee went with him. The following week, Tennessee fans must have thought the plague wasn't far behind as Cockrell tore up his knee in a win over Auburn. Still, UT persevered, winning six of their last eight, including a Garden State Bowl triumph over Wisconsin to finish at eight and four, the ball's most wins since 1973. Not surprisingly, Majors has a great affinity for this team. I was more concerned about the 81 team probably than any team in the last 13 years. And we got trumped the first two weeks against Georgia and Southern Cal. Came back and we won eight games, including the bowl game, and then that was shows you with people sticking together that you get surprises some way, both ways, and uh, extenuating circumstances, unfortunate injuries, losing the close games. And when you win the close games, you sometimes win a championship, or at least have a good winning season. So that, uh, that's one of the best lesson builders. And I've used those examples to our team and staff on many occasions to talk about what happens if you keep hanging on, keep keeping on, keep coming back, keep fighting back. 1982 was remembered best by Vol fans for two things, the World's Fair and the end of the jinx. Of the Southland marching band marches from the formation facing the South End Zone where the national anthem has just been played and sung into the traditional team. Stretching for the East Stand, the corridor leading the ball dressing room to the West Sideline. The band is there. There are thousands of orange balloons as well. And now as Tennessee comes on to the field, Alabama's Lewis looking over the defense. Long count. Lewis. Fumble. Scramble. There's a battle for the football near the 14 yard line, down to the 11 yard line. The football has been recovered by Tennessee at the 11 yard line. Back to throw.
throw Cockwell. Cockwell looking. Cockwell's going to throw a bomb downfield to Willie Goff. This one will be... It will be for Tennessee first down at 10. Cockwell handoff, left side, close, gets to the 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, give him 6, touchdown, Big Iron! That's the throw is Lewis, he's going to throw it to Lewis, Lewis looking, being pressured, pass down into the end zone, it is intercepted Tennessee, intercepted on the touchdown, Tennessee by 19, Big Iron with the and all of a sudden I found the ball in my arms. Knowing, uh, knowing that, the next thing I knew, I had Reggie White all over me, laughing and grinning in my face, telling me that we had won. 17 seconds left to go in the football game. Tennessee leads Alabama 35 to 28. Cockwell falls on the ball. The seconds will pick down. There are now, ladies and gentlemen, 10 seconds to go. We're going to let you count it down as Tennessee will beat Alabama. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Final score, Tennessee 35, Alabama 28. The victory ended 11 years of frustration and set off Bedlam in Knoxville. As Bear Bryant walked across the field to grasp Johnny Major's hand, Majors came down off his players' shoulders to meet the winningest coach in college football history. It was a moment that will never be forgotten for those in attendance. Well, I got down off the shoulders, but I shook hands with Coach Bryant. Oh, he put a lot of shoulders against a lot of coaches through the past, and I got off and he says, Johnny said you you had a good game plan. Congratulations. That's it. He wasn't a man a lot of extra words at times, but I really got to know Coach Bryant quite well through the years. He always was very very kind to me. He always asked about my dad. He knew my dad and tried to recruit Bob and tried to recruit me back in Kentucky. So I met him as, a, as an assistant coach when I first started coaching and used to call him on the phone about some advice and went out and watched him practice a few times during my travels. Uh, he was an interesting person. He handled it right. He and Coach Bryant loved to win, and he knew how to win, but he also knew how to lose. He knew how to do it like a gentleman and like a true sportsman. It shouldn't come as a surprise, but kicking was a highlight in the 1982 season. As sophomore Fouad Rivage nailed 27 of 31 field goals on his way to becoming UT's all-time leading scorer. Fouad would perform brilliantly for the next two years before passing on the Tennessee's great kicking torch to his brother, Carlos, who would perform just as adeptly. The Ravese brothers were preceded by some great kickers at UT. Soccer stylists like Gary Wright, Carl Crimser, and George Hunt. And then it was the barefoot bomber, Ricky Townsend, who became an All-American in 1972. Late in the 1970s, the son of missionaries became a household name to UT backers as Alan Duncan began booming them through the uprights. Speaking of booming them, how could you forget the punters who have made Tennessee's great kicking tradition complete? It began with Beatty Feathers in the early 30s and continued with Johnny Majors in the 50s. But in between those two was another great ball punter named George Capago. Capago's importance wouldn't be just as a player. He would return to UT with Bowden Wyatt in 1955 and tutor UT punters and place kickers for the next 30 years. You've heard about his place kickers, and the list of his punters is equally impressive. Ron Whitby was a three-sport star at Tennessee in the mid-60s, but found time to set back opposing teams with his thunderous kicks. Speaking of thunderous, what about Thunderfoot Herman Weaver, Neil Claybo, and the family tradition on the punting side, Craig Colquitt and his nephew Jimmy. The newest inductee to this list has to be Tennessee's punter in 1988-89, Kent Elmore. These players have been a help to the ball defense throughout the years. And in 1983, their assistance wasn't as badly needed as it had been the previous year. In that season, Vol fans got a glimpse of a great defense and a great defensive player. The player was a defensive lineman from Chattanooga named Reggie White. 
After two years of nagging injuries, White began to dominate the line of scrimmage and lifted the Tennessee defense from worst to first in the Southeastern Conference. The Minister of Defense had some help, however. The key factor of what's happening in good defense was not only Reggie, but we had some other good defensive linemen like John Williams and Mark Studaway. So uh, most of the time, those guys, they kept the blocks off of us, and we just basically ran to the ball and made the play. In the midst of a 9-3 season in which Reggie White led the best defense of the SEC, defense went out the window, and Johnny Jones came to the front, sparking UT to a 17-point fourth period as the balls came from behind to beat the Tide 41-34. to He was going to the right at first for the Allen, checked off, went to the left, because everyone was blitzing in, so it was really open on the outside. Uh, you really couldn't believe it at first because, you know, everything is happening, so I guess you said fast, but <laughs> they like took forever to get to the goal line. <laughs> Jones built on this game to go on to become the first Tennessee back ever to rush for 1,000 yards in a season. The following year, it happened again. Jones went for another 1,000 yards plus, and Tennessee beat Alabama for the third straight year. Seeing Tony Robinson rally the balls for 15 points in the final four minutes, to garner a 28 to 27 win. Now it was Tennessee fans talking jinx. Tennessee people began, well, we've got Alabama's number, and I think Tennessee thought that a little bit. Tennessee was not sharp in the 84 game, not sharp at all. Were a better team than certainly they displayed. And yet at the end, Tennessee, uh, the last quarter, uh, really came on and won it on confidence. As 1985 dawned, no one saw what was coming. The Volunteers, yes, had been to four straight bowl games, but really hadn't been that close to winning an SEC championship. So when UCLA came to Knoxville to open the season, a win really wasn't expected or obtained. The game ended a 26-all tie. But it was the Bruins who were forced to rally for the tie, scoring 16 points in the final five minutes. Next up, it was number one Auburn and their illustrious tailback Bo Jackson. But Tony Robinson is the player who got the accolades for that day. Robinson sets his team in the eye for mission. Robinson fakes, play action, long pass down into the end zone. The man is there. Give him six. Touchdown, Tennessee. T. Rob threw four scoring passes as UT ironed out a convincing 38 to 20 victory. Those who didn't believe were beginning to. Even after a 17 to 10 loss at Florida, the Vols' confidence was growing. As Tennessee went to Birmingham to stare down the Alabama gauntlet, it was obvious that a win could help the Vols in the conference title chase. In the third period, with the Big Orange in front 13 to seven, Tennessee was driving for what appeared to be a touchdown that would put Bama away for good. When Robinson's knee was mangled in a mass of humanity, Robinson was done for the year and it was up to Daryl Dickey to carry the balls home. I knew that Tony had been hurt pretty bad and that uh, when they were uh, around him on the football field and then got him to bring him off the field, it didn't look good anyway for the remainder of the game. Uh, the remainder of the season, that wasn't in my mind at that point, it was just the remainder of the football game and what we needed to do to, to maintain and, and, and keep the win. Uh, as far as what was going through my mind, my, what was going through my mind, I didn't want to make a mistake that was going to cost us a football game. Dickey got some big help from running back Keith Davis and the ball defense, including this brilliant play by defensive captain Dale Jones. Shula back to throw, left hand, out into the flat, flat, broken up, was that intercepted in midair? Ladies and gentlemen, what a play by Dale Jones. He was two feet away from Mike Shula, and as Shula released the ball, Dale Jones just reached out and picked it out of midair, an unbelievable interception. As UT hung on to a 16-14 victory, it was a bittersweet triumph at best. The Volunteers tied Georgia Tech the next week on a late Carlos Reves field goal, but that was the only blot the rest of the way. Tennessee's defense just got stronger under the tutelage of coordinator Ken Donahue, and Dickey became a confident field general. Suddenly, UT was a win over Vanderbilt away from the Sugar Bowl and their first conference title in 16 years. The lowly Commodores were no match for the Vols as the 30 to nothing Big Orange win could have been a lot worse. The celebration began. 
Tennessee was headed to New Orleans for its first Sugar Bowl in 15 years, and Miami was the opponent. The 10-1 Hurricanes were led by their talented quarterback, Vinny Testaverde, and were heavy favorites to dismantle the 8-1-2 balls. When the game began, that looked exactly like what would happen as Jimmy Johnson's team used a fake punt to set up the game's first touchdown. Tennessee came back to score as Darrell Dickey hit Jeff Smith. And with the game even, UT began to gain confidence as the unbelievably partisan crowd cheered them on. And Testaverde is back. He's got him in man. Pressure's on and they got him. Back inside the 15. Dale Jones led it. Tennessee took a 14-7 lead into the dressing room. We were beginning to get confident. I don't think our confidence against Miami at the start of the game was very good. But as time went on, yeah, we can block these guys. Yeah, we can run with these guys. And, and uh, as the second quarter came, we had a lot of confidence. And we were starting to get some momentum, and, and the ball started rolling in our favor. In the second half, it was all orange. Dale Jones, Chris White, Tim McGee, and then Jeff Powell. Miami in a four-man front. Give Powell right side 40, 45, 50, gets outside 45, 40, 35, 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 60 yards. Jeff Powell, touchdown, Big Island. Powell's story is incredible. The Nashville native transferred to UT from William & Mary with only one year of eligibility. Majors gives an assist to his coaching staff for Powell's success. In the last scrimmage, a couple of our coaches locked him in with our scout squad running against our varsity. I said, Coach, I think he's got some potential. We put him on scholarship. And I'm pleased that we were very fortunate we did. Because he came in, he was one of the heroes of the Super Bowl. Powell was one of many heroes that night as it ended 35 to 7. An unbelievable result to the college football world. Named as most valuable player of the game, Dickey stood with his father and mother. With everyone in tears, he had led the volunteers from nowhere to number four in the nation. It was a very emotional moment for me and my family, and uh, uh, especially after the ball game when we all finally did get together there. It was uh, pretty emotional and uh, very exciting. Very exciting. It was a great, great football game and uh, a culmination of a great season, a great football team together. We played together. Uh, as a team better than any team I've ever been around or ever seen and I think that's what championships are made of and that team uh, culminated that and uh, that's what uh, made the 85 championship so good. Everything was so good on this trip for Vol fans. Bourbon Street, Jimmy Kelly's and Jackson Square are only some of the places that Tennessee partisans took over the week before the game but then kickoff rolled around. So then you go to the game and everybody says it's been a great happen great experience so what Miami's better they're gonna beat us but we've had a great time Miami scores first and everybody says well just like I said we're gonna lose to come from behind and roll them out of there was that makes the experience more exciting than it would have ever been and that whole experience went beyond just the football game that was something that there's no way to ever explain what it was like. One of the most moving times of my life was uh, when we took the bus ride back from the airport to Gibbs Hall and seeing people along the highway waving at Tennessee down, stopping their cars, blinking their lights on the way from work. And frankly, uh, I was touched to the point where I, uh, I couldn't fight the tears back. I don't think I've ever got any more pleasure out of a victory than this one because it meant so much to so many. We have been so loyal to Tennessee through the years. It meant so much to the players, certainly to the coaches, families, but also the great Tennessee people who were there physically, the ones on TV. And I've heard more people say after that game that other than the birth of their first child, or other than their marriage, or other than the first Christmas they can remember, that that's the most exciting event in their whole life. But there was always another season to play. 1986 was a letdown as the Vols went 7 and 5. UT rebounded in 87 to win 10 games for the first time in 15 years. The Vols won the kickoff classic over Iowa, but not before Darren Miller made the play of the year. Running back a fumble 96 yards for a touchdown. In viewing his run back, Miller gets an escort from Terry McDaniel, a man who knew exactly what he was doing. 
45 to the 40, 35, 30, Darren Miller, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. It is Darren Miller, Flemington, New Jersey, intercepted, carries that intercepted fumble, 98 yards, and Tennessee turns an apparent impossible situation into a touchdown. Basically, I was just trying to put in appearance in there. I didn't want to try to block someone and clip them and then send the play back. So I was just trying to get in people's way and slow them down so he can advance. After the exciting classic, the game of the year was a tie against Auburn. Coming from 10 points down in the fourth period, the talented Vol offensive line opened a hole on fourth and one that allowed eventual 1,000-yard rusher Reggie Cobb to take it into the end zone. I don't think people realize how uh, tough that was coming from behind to, to score 10 points in the last uh, seven minutes against that defense. Losses to Alabama and Boston College marred an otherwise good season as the Volunteers headed to the Peach Bowl for the second time in five years. The win over Indiana marked Tennessee's seventh straight bowl appearance. But that was to end in 88, as the Big Orange started the season a school worst 0-5. UT had problems, and Coach Majors, having seen success in the preceding years, made a move. Realigning the defensive staff before the Alabama game, the moves apparently worked, as the Big Orange won their final five games. The momentum carried over to 89, as the Vols won their opener over Colorado State, and then took UCLA apart at the Rose Bowl. After a victory over Duke, Tennessee ran wild in a 21-14 upset over Auburn. This is Webb through the left side. Five, four, three, two, one. The crowd will tell you. Touchdown, Big Auburn. Going into the Auburn game, we really had something to prove. And uh, I think uh, that, that game probably set the tempo for us and really what kind of team we wanted to be. Georgia fell next. And Duvall seemed to have it all going on tailbacks Reggie Cobb and Chuck Webb forming the best one-two punch in college football. The week before the Alabama game, Cobb was dismissed from the team, and the Vols fell to the tide 47-30. That would be the only blot of the season's record as Webb picked up the slack. Andy Kelly provided a threat at quarterback, and freshman Carl Pickens proved that even in this day and age, a player can work effectively on both sides of the football. Tennessee began the 90s in its second major bowl in four years, dropping Arkansas 31 to 27 to complete the year at 11 and one. This victory also marked the 600th in Tennessee football history. Think about it. 600 wins in the last century of football and 11 college football Hall of Fame players. Linemen like Herman Hickman, Bob Johnson, Nathan Dougherty, Bowden Wyatt, and the SEC player of the quarter century from 1951 through 75, Doug Atkins. What about backs like Gene McEver, Beatty Feathers, Bobby Dodd, George Cafago, and the current coach of the balls, Johnny Majors? I've never regretted becoming a Tennessee volunteer. I look back and nothing was ever replace my early experiences from the first day I came on the campus, which I'll never forget the early days on a championship team, starting my coaching career here. You'll see many familiar and unfamiliar names in the next few minutes. And these men had different roles that provided them with different amounts of playing time that gave them different levels of football glory. But all of them contributed to Tennessee's 600 wins, 13 conference titles, and 30 bowl games. The 1951 National Championship team is the most memorable Vol squad. But who can forget that the 39 edition is the college football team to hold all of its regular season opponents scoreless. And that the 1970 Tennessee defense had a school record 36 interceptions. There have been over 60 All-Americans at Tennessee and one of the greatest coaches of all time, General Robert Neelan. He spent 32 years in Knoxville, molding UT into a football power. Neelan is also in the College Football Hall of Fame for his achievements. The University of Tennessee has benefited from the great moments of its football program and will benefit from the great moments to come. When it's all said and done, football is simply a game but to Vol fans, it's more than that. It is a source 
of involvement for people that last their whole life. And that to me is the best thing about college football is the impact for good it has in people's enjoyment of life. This is the University of Tennessee, and this is the Tennessee Vol story. As a matter of fact, jumping about a good deal one time at a Vanderbilt game when we were not involved and Tennessee was played somebody else, I heard a lady back of me, I sat in the stands then, this was at Nashville, and she said she didn't think anybody ought to play Tennessee, they were just too tough and too mean. Any good Dewey Warren stories come to mind? Oh, repeatable. Well, that's <laughs> it's. Uh, I one time he was he was uh, he called a pass play and with me playing tight end and Johnny Mills was the wide out and then Richmond Flowers was uh, the wing back. Flowers was fast; he could get there in a hurry. But but Johnny. Uh, was just like me, he was slow. But we ran fairly decent routes, but it was good because Dewey was slow going back to set up, and so it, it put real pressure on the offensive line. Because they did, they had they would have to block for maybe a second longer to hold their blocks. And this boy played tackle named Elliot Gamage from Cedartown, Georgia. And he played weak side tackle. Dewey called the pass play in the huddle. We go after passes. This guy's coming in, taking a bead on Dewey. Elliot's thrown a block and missed the guy, and he turned around and sees this guy hit, he's gonna hit Dewey from the blind side. So he hollers, Dewey, look out! And that guy, about the time he said that, just leveled Dewey. The ball went one way, Dewey went the other way. We got back to huddle, and Dewey was kind of looking out the ear hole in his helmet. He said, Gamage, what's this look out stuff? Except he said it a little more, it was a little uh, more explicit than what, what I can say here. That was unfortunate for him, wasn't it? He might have gotten to play a little more. <laughs> <laughs> but in some ways, it really did affect him and you that way because his numbers were down. I mean, you scored a lot of touchdowns. Well, I pushed him, and apparently he did pretty well with the push. Of course, we felt awfully good about our teams back in those years. We were very successful. 1951, we won a national championship in football, and we almost won a national championship the same year in baseball. We went to the national finals almost uh, national championships in two sports the same year. For success is athletics, an area where Tennessee has long had a winning tradition with one of the most dynamic athletic programs in the United States. Led by enthusiastic young coaches of proven ability, Tennessee's athletic teams are championship caliber. So you can be a part of an overall sports program with a winning tradition to help you earn yourself national recognition. Athletes live first class at Tennessee, beginning here at air-conditioned Gibbs Hall, the athletic dorm at Tennessee, with its comfortable, tastefully decorated rooms. The spirit of self-discipline is encouraged by the coaching staff, members of which visit rooms to provide the counsel and leadership young men desire. Oh, I just always tell people whenever I'm speaking somewhere or something, I tell them a little bit about Tennessee tradition and different things. And, and the days back when they used to have the walking horse and how that uh, 
pregame warm-ups come run out through the tee and you get down and stretch out and everything and you always had to watch because one day I stretched down and my white pants ended up being kind of brown because I did a split right in the middle of the dog or the horse's mistake out on the field. For the first big lick I hit in Tennessee uniform against Duke in 73 and running out on the field knocking our head drum major flat on his back and uh, a lot of crazy things happened, a lot of fun things though. The Doug Dickey Show, exclusive films of the Tennessee Vols featuring Tennessee football coach Doug Dickey. Presented every week by... Well, that was really an exciting time for Tennessee. Uh, what happened was that uh, it was really hoped that they could wait until after the Sugar Bowl game to announce that Coach Majors was going to come back. But there's no way the media in Tennessee was going to let it just sit idle for a, a month and just engage in idle speculation about what was going to happen. So it leaked out on December 3rd, as a matter of fact, on a Friday, uh, that Coach uh, Coach Majors was going to come from Pittsburgh to Tennessee. Uh, Tennessee confirmed it on the 3rd, and then on the 4th, which was a Saturday, they brought Coach Majors in here for a press conference. We had a total of 121 people uh, at the press conference, and that was strictly the media people. No outsiders were allowed. We had a guard at the door, Bud Ford, who enjoyed keeping people out, uh, stationed outside the door to make sure that nobody got in there except the media. And actually, the total was 121 persons, which was an unprecedented number for a press conference at that time. Johnny Majors, a moment to remember and savor. Yes, there's something. Keep talking. <laughs> yeah, okay, Keep talking. you got me. I owe you one. It's <laughs> <laughs> something you'll never forget, and they can't take it away from me. But again, we've got to go to Birmingham next year and play Georgia Tech this week. It's a happy day. It really is. Tennessee wins over Alabama. Final score is 35 to 28. The Volunteers prevail. Tennessee now on the year 3-2-1. Alabama's record is now 5-1. Till next week for Coach Johnny Majors, John Ward says so long, everyone. The stadium seats over 55,000 fans and draws not only capacity crowds, but also the nation's most famous sports writers and TV and radio broadcasters who cover the games from the modern press box. Tennessee has long been one of the nation's great football schools. And the Volunteers have one of the four best one-loss records among major college teams during the past 25 years. Included in these great football teams are national champions, bowl game champions, and a host of All-American and professional stars. The University of Tennessee Pride of the Southland Band adds color and class to all Tennessee sports events. Led by its famous marching majorettes, the Tennessee band has appeared on national TV and is recognized as one of the finest college bands in the entire country. Just another way, athletics is first class at Tennessee.